take it away, Dan, president of Photosynthesis Productions. Go ahead. Thanks. It's, it's fun to see some familiar faces and some new ones out there. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, films uh, and videos can, can really do powerful things uh, with explaining science. We can go to places we couldn't otherwise go, like underneath the Cornell campus by several thousand feet and see things we couldn't otherwise see with microscopes and, and go places. And they can be inspiring and educational, but they can also be confusing and kind of mystifying sometimes. And with, with new animation, it can create this amazing and completely artificial world. So it's kind of hard to know what's real sometimes. Um, but I'm tonight I'm just gonna talk a little bit of my own experience writing and directing and producing science films over the last 30 some years uh, for the National Geographic Society, the National Science Foundation, Cornell, and many others. I'm gonna share a few uh, video clips, uh, including the latest uh, version of work in progress uh, on the Cornell University Borehole Observatory, this being the early results video, which is the last in our public outreach series uh, we've been uh, creating following along with this fat, uh, pioneering experience. Um, the video for Kubo is still a work in progress, so it's kind of, it will help be kind of a case study in making science videos. <laughs> um, all of my education in filmmaking has been on the job. My undergraduate degree uh, was from UC Berkeley in the 60s, where uh, we, uh, feeling empowered as we were in the 60s, I guess, uh, uh, created a new, an experimental interdisciplinary field major called Conservation of Natural Resources. At the time, you could take forestry and you could learn how to raise ducks for hunters and you could do plant science, but there was no real, nothing brought it together. Um, so we, uh, under the advice of Starker Leopold, who was a professor there, uh, we started this field uh, major, and now it's a whole college of natural resources, uh, which I think is kind of cool. Um, after graduation there, I got a really wonderful uh, job um, at the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission, which is uh, was one of the very first um, multi-county regulatory agencies that was protecting San Francisco Bay. San Francisco Bay was being filled in at an alarming rate. And this was a, a group that, um, that got the power to control bay fill and, and um, development within a 100 foot shoreline band. Um, so that was a fabulous, fabulous job that I loved a lot. But um, I decided I needed a master's degree and ended up at Cornell um, with my husband who's all native uh, Ithacan. So, uh, we just sort of stayed around. Um, I had a very lucky chance getting involved with photosynthesis uh, because uh, my next door neighbor was friends with a, a filmmaker named Peter Carroll. And Pete needed some cute kids for a birthday party scene for a film uh, for National Geographic called Solid Liquid Gas. And birthday parties, uh, this was for you know elementary school. And birthday parties have all of those things: <laughs> the helium balloons, the blowing things, the melting ice cream, the candles. Uh, and so Pete called and introduced himself. And I said, "Well, gee, my kids aren't having a birthday soon." And so we kind of hung up. And then I thought, "Well, what am I thinking? Uh, I definitely want to. How I'm going to have a bogus birthday party for the National Geographic Society?" And one thing led to another, it just clicked and I got hired to help uh, Pete and the founder of the company, David Gluck, to organize and do research. And so now I have the privilege of owning and leading the company after a long, a long time. So back in the day, when I first started out, we made a lot of films, 27, for the educational division of National Geographic. We were shooting on 16 millimeter film and that was how it was released to the schools. You know, the teacher had to drag out the projector and loop it up. And so 
anyway, that was um, where we got started working. Uh, it was it was fun. I would get a one sentence description of the topic and the intended age, and I would go to the Tompkins County Public Library. Um, one time it was we needed a film on teeth for kindergartners. So I, you know, did the research at the library and then moved on to many of the experts on both of the hills in this town, Vithika, who could give us, you know, good advice. Uh, we got the science videos uh, from the stable of filmmakers of Geographic at the time. I think because uh, and other producers got history and social studies. And I think we got the physics and the chemistry and the astronomy uh, because we weren't afraid to try to figure out how to tell, teach these things um, to young children. And, you know, that's a, <laughs> explaining things to get color to kindergartners. You know, it's, it's not easy. <laughs> And I was very good training for the work I do now, explaining things to the general public, of course. Um, one project that was particularly cool was we documented the construction of the Green Bank Telescope uh, in West Virginia, which is the, full, the largest fully steerable radio telescope in the world. Uh, it has a 100 meter diameter dish um, that's on top of a 250 foot tower that means that the dish can turn to follow a faint radio source uh, for a huge portion of the sky. So it's very sensitive. Um, and it's just this gigantic machine, which is just a lot of fun to, to follow along with. Um, I think, so I think we're gonna show, I'm gonna ask uh, Don to, to share um, a, a screen, but I wanna say one thing about it is that doing, knowing I was giving this talk, it was fun. I, thought back over a lot of stuff over the years. Uh, and as a result, I had uh, Norm in my shop put together this, um, what I'm calling a science sizzle. And uh, it, it explains how we got our, I mean, I hope it shows how we got our PSP logo and how important it is to our brand. So, okay, Don, take it away. Right. I will take it away and get to the right place here. Let's see. Right one. That's the right one. Here we go. The shadow of the moon is always out there. It's whipping around in space, and we're going to be right under it. And uh, traveled almost halfway around the world to get here.
<laughs> Back to you, Deb. Yeah, and I'll nice. just, I will jump in and say, I am looking forward to my third total solar eclipse in, in April, which will pass directly over my house. So, uh, you have any parking? <laughs> <laughs> we will see. We will see. And anybody's welcome. <laughs> no, I highly recommend the, the, an eclipse. It was yeah. just a fabulous thing. And so that's sort of, it was so impressive to all of us that that became how we got our logo. And so, um, so that was fun for me to see. Um, I, at one point during it, I, you probably, it, it's kind of mixed up, but uh, in 1995, we switched from uh, shooting film to videotape for acquisition and from editing on a we were editing on a multi-plate flatbed um, and it was switched to a Macintosh computer. So we, show, we sold our flatbed to Ken Burns, yep. who apparently had enough assistance to make editing on film still work, um, and uh, bought an Avid Media Composer uh, edit suite. So the, it was very exciting. We thought, oh, it's going to make edit, you know our lives so much easier. Well. <laughs> digital world does not necessarily do that. Um, it's much easier to edit with a nonlinear system. Uh, we can add effects and animations. Uh, but on the other hand, we end up, you know, because tape or SD card digits are, are, um, are cheap. So we just uh, keep the camera rolling more, experiment more. Um, and so it can take end up taking quite a bit more time in some ways to wade through the footage and find what you really need. Um, and then, of course, there's the expectation of, you know, that we're Pixar <laughs> from clients. Um, so there's a big expectation of sophisticated graphics. But, um, you know, I like to tell our team, you know, it's a challenge. We have to work within the budget. Um, but, you know, we do we do good work, I think. Uh, we just don't have millions of dollars to do it. Um, so, and also just because you can do fancy bells and whistles doesn't always mean it's a good idea, uh, especially in, in science, I think. Um, what case in point might be, we had one unnamed client who hired us to do 20, 20 minute films for use in middle and high school classrooms. Um, it was one, you know, great contract, challenging, lots of interesting titles, nuclear energy lab, safety, DNA, bioluminescence. But we soon learned that they wanted to be able to check off boxes on a standard list or standards or something, rather than care if these jam-packed, fact-packed videos uh, were going to result in the students building any real knowledge with them. Um, we did the best we could. And, it was a very important, it was learning experience on how to not make a video about DNA, but to make the best one you could. Um, they look, these videos look great, uh, they're at, but they're relentless. I mean, I pity the poor high schoolers who have to, you know, sit through those 20 minutes of just a barrage of information that, you know, maybe it will excite some of them and they'll probably learn something, but it was, uh, anyway, I was, not uh, sorry when that contract was finished. Um, so 20 years ago, I was really thrust into the leadership here when my boss and longtime colleague David uh, passed away unexpectedly. It was really a hard transition, but ultimately I bought PSP because I couldn't think of anything I could possibly do that would be more interesting and varied uh, and impactful. And I remember one day, I, for a while, I looked, I came into the studio and I, I realized it struck me that I could do whatever I wanted with this business. Um, I have to make money because it is a business. And Cornell has been a bread and butter work that has kept us alive. But we've been able to pursue a bunch of projects on our own, which is, is super great. And um, I'm, I'm really pleased with that. Um, the work for Cornell is always different. You know, pigeons measuring the speed of light. Uh, that was a good one. Uh, agricultural biodiversity, composting in the classroom, and uh, dog CPR, cat spay surgery. Uh, it <laughs> it's, it's fascinating. Um, one part that was uh, one project that was a big part of our work for seven years was uh, something called Think Water. 
was funded by National Science Foundation uh, through the University of Wisconsin. And we made really award-winning videos that supported their concept uh, that the next big thing in water education isn't water, it's thinking about water. <laughs> and NSF agreed that we didn't need a new fancy poster about the water cycle, but we needed some kind of new approach. Um, a bunch of shots in the science sizzle were showing things we shot to show the, the impact of taking a perspective uh, and making distinctions. Maybe some of you noticed some of that. Um, one thing the sizzle reel, I realized, you know, it's all cool. Well, it's sizzle, but we, we've always tried to actually show that, that science, you know, consists of observing the world, but, you know, listening, observing, recording, it's curiosity uh, in thoughtful action. And uh, so that's sort of missing from that sizzle reel, but it's really important you know, part of our work um, for connecting with the audience so that they can care about what they're seeing on screen. and and uh, maybe develop a, a concept of how science works um, and build their own knowledge. So onward to Kubo. Um, working with the Kubo outreach team has been great. Uh, Terry Jordan from Cornell Geology and Don and Bob Ross from PRI. You know, we've been meeting for years, I think. Um, we started meeting and talked about the history of energy at Cornell and all these big issues, and then we got real about what was important for the general public to know what was going on um, when what looked like a natural gas fracking rig went up next to Cornell Orchards. Um, and so it was a uh, very purposeful and interesting work and fascinating. Um, so uh, where you're about to see a rough cut, um, which means there's no final sound mix, things, the levels might be off. We need some more B-roll, which is just miscellaneous shots of thing, uh, the, uh, of Kubo or other things. And some, um, the animations are really all first draft sketches. Um, the Kubo hosts that you'll see uh, include Kiana, Don's very talented daughter, uh, who has been a wonderful host for our journey. And um, Roberto, who's uh, Terry Jordan's grad student. Um, so uh, take it away, Don, with the Kubo. Please. All right. Here we go for Kubo. Geologists and engineers have had a busy time working together on the innovative Cornell University Borehole Observatory, or Kubo. The drilling, collecting, lining, cementing, testing, measuring, and recording went on for 24 hours a day for 62 days. All of these people came together to try to solve one of humanity's biggest challenges, climate change due to burning carbon-based fossil fuels. The solution we are working on is to test an alternative way to heat our buildings using the heat deep within the earth. It must be exciting to have had some time to study the information that you collected so deep underground. Yeah, we learned a lot about a piece of the Earth's crust that had been completely inaccessible to us. We wanted to find out more about the composition and strength of the rock under the Cornell campus, as well as how fractures in them might allow water to flow through. We learned about the composition of the rock from the cuttings or ground up bits of rocks that were delivered to the surface as the big drill bit worked its way down. It's interesting to see the interruptions in the rock properties you observed because they might be flow paths for water. That's right. We also transmitted electrical energy as well as sound waves into the rocks around the borehole, much like a sonogram used for medical imaging. The two methods created images of fractures in the borehole wall and also tens of feet out into the surrounding rock. These images reveal that there are at least three sets of fractures which exist in the lower part of the Kubo borehole. Other instruments were lowered down the hole to look for gaps that might be suitable for water flow. 
a thermometer to look for a temperature that's a bit irregular, and a pressurized chamber with a pressure gauge to learn whether water would move into or out of the rock walls of the borehole. Information from all these tests show that there are several zones at depths from 7,800 feet down to around 9,500 feet, in which some water moved in and out of the Kubo borehole. Another Kubo objective was to learn about the natural stresses underground in order to determine which of the naturally weak surfaces are more likely to allow water to pass through. The alignment of the stresses determines major parts of the design of the future geothermal reservoir. The strength of the rock was measured by the drilling itself and by special pressure tests, which showed that the sedimentary rocks in the depth range of 7,800 to 9,400 feet are extremely strong. In addition, small cylindrical samples of rock from Kubo's walls are being tested to find out their elastic properties and what pressure is needed to break them. We are particularly interested in the magnitudes and directions of the stresses on rock layers underground. We are able to learn the direction of the maximum horizontal stress from the shape of the borehole after drilling ended. For the whole length of the Kubo borehole, the shape of the hole shows consistently that the larger of the horizontal stresses is aligned in the northeast-southwest direction. So it looks like zones that might be more favorable for circulating water are either fracture zones that are nearly vertical and oriented toward the northeast, or the nearly horizontal weakness zones between the sedimentary rock layers. That's right. So Roberto, what comes next? Corner researchers and our colleagues are continuing to analyze the information already gathered, and new research continues today with instruments being put down the borehole to collect new data. We are working to determine the possible location and orientation of demonstration wells that could produce heat for the campus. We will be sure to follow along as Kubo leads us to the next steps in harnessing the heat beneath our feet. you do. Thanks. So, um, so I, you know, that was rough, but I, I think uh, a lot of it looked uh, better than the last time I actually had a chance to review our work. So, um, but most of my recent work for Cornell has been for undergrads and high schools and sometimes for teachers um, and sometimes just promotional for Cornell. Uh, a lot of it has very straightforward science info but almost always they are also designed to attract or feature underrepresented minorities in the science programs. This is, uh, you know, representation matters and not just in the work of the classroom, but in the very substance of the research that is being thought of and funded uh, in the questions that are being asked. And so um, I've been really happy to be part of an effort to make the way science is conducted at you know, top place like Cornell, um, show that, you know, how diversity strengthens the science and the people who are doing it. So um, that leads me, I have, I have one more video I, um, I'd want to show. Uh, and this is a little, uh, because I can't resist the opportunity to show you the trailer, two minute trailer for a film I just released called Move When the Spirit Says Move the legacy of Dorothy Foreman Cotton. Uh, Dorothy was a civil rights leader, the only woman on Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, executive committee uh, who lived the last 30 years of her life here in Ithaca. And uh, we've been lucky enough to be able to craft a film um, telling her story and uh, inspiring, what we hope is inspiring uh, action uh, for the future. So, um, I just, because I have a captive audience, and also I should say that it's being shown um, here in Ithaca at Cinemopolis for a week's run, uh, which is an encore performance backed by popular demand, uh, net starting 
tomorrow night for a week at Cinemopolis in downtown Ithaca. So um, with that, we can watch this two minute trailer and then I'm happy to talk. That's great. And I will note that I just saw the movie a couple of weeks ago myself and it was great. I remember we were in a meeting with Dr. King once. He said, Dorothy, would you mind getting me a cup of coffee? And Dorothy said, Andy, get your boss a cup of coffee. <laughs> I had power, even though some of the men maybe saw me as the woman at the table. There's a fine balancing line between living and working respectfully with six men who all feel that they walk on water. It's not shocking to me when people know about Martin Luther King and not how he rose to prominence in relationship with the work that Dorothy Cotton was holding and the advice that she was giving. A lot of us are trained to be invisible. Just do the work. And sometimes when you're doing the work, you don't have time or a desire to be in the dominant mood. Voting in itself can be very transactional, but when you're talking about doing the work like Dorothy Cotton did, helping people have a sense of their own power, that is what's transformative. In my uh, generation, when I always say I was a teacher, you always think of a woman. The 1960s, when it was dangerous to teach a Negro, to be caught teaching black people for a woman, and particularly teaching them what she was teaching, could get you raped and killed. The program that Dorothy directed was, quote, from Andrew Young, the best kept secret of the civil rights movement. So, and open it up for questions. I will note that when um, when I saw it in Cinemopolis a few weeks ago, there was applause afterwards, which I haven't seen in a movie theater in a while. Yeah, yeah opening night we had a full house and a standing ovation, but it was people who were all you know. A lot of people knew Dorothy, and you know, it's a lot of people that are in Ithaca, so it's sort of a easy audience, but right, still. Right. But still. But still, actually, we're showing it a lot all over the country and having good success with it. So I hope um, lots of people will see it. All right. Uh -huh. I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, and we're a small crowd tonight, so you can just uh, either uh, raise your hand um, physically or, uh, or use the raise your hand fu function in uh, Zoom. And Rob's got a hand, a hand up. <laughs> okay. Hey, then. Yeah, the, the movie is fabulous, the Dorothy Cotton movie. And so I was just curious um, about if you could tell us a little bit about how that movie came to be. It's uh, not a science movie per se. I can see the connections, <laughs> but I think it might be a step out of what you've mostly been doing over the past few decades. And I wondered how you got involved and whether you foresee doing other projects um in that arena uh yes well you know when when uh when photosynthesis was first founded you know we did a couple of films with yuri bronfenbrenner and so the work was always very um social justice you know human ecology the documentary film sort of part of the business uh was very much focused on uh, on that sort of thing we did a film about daycare um and then um, I, I guess that going way back, we did a film about transracial adoption, which uh, it turns out is still the sort of the standard, you know, it's, it's used all over the country in all sorts of trainings and workshops uh, because a colleague had adopted a child and said, hey, there's nothing good about this. We, I mean, about the media that they have to educate parents about what they're, um, what's ahead for them to prepare them. And 
So we learned, you know, that that film just opened our uh, my eyes to um, a different, you know, more to racism and uh, injustice and all of the various other things that I wanted to do something about. And that about that time is when when all of a sudden the business was mine. And I got. Um, and actually, right away then, and maybe it's it's. I'm sorry, people don't know about this. We made a, a, a nice documentary called. It's not a documentary, a more narrative mashup called Civil Warriors, which is about 26 black men from Ithaca who enlisted in the U.S. Colored Troops and fought in the Civil War. And you know that you know is we have a curriculum that's used in a lot of classrooms around the country. It's you know didn't didn't get into theaters it's kind of a it's hard movie that one but uh then um a friend of mine told me that Dorothy Cotton and her colleagues were going to Palestine to do a listening tour with the Palestinians and their Israeli allies on to see if there was any way that the nonviolent approach of the 60s could be helpful to them. And that there were also, there were not Palestinians and Israelis using a nonviolent approach to resolve their conflicts. And there was some thought that I could go along with them and do a film about them. I thought, well, that sounds cool. So I uh, called up Dorothy and I said, hey, can I do an interview with you uh, about this trip? And we could use it as a fundraising tool. You know, people will give us money and then we can go with you. And so she we she said maybe, and she called me back and said that all of her colleagues said she shouldn't do it, so she was going, so I should just come pick her up. <laughs> <laughs> so I went and I picked her up, and we ended up talking for an hour about her life, and you know, I, we could have gone on forever if I had only known. But then uh, we didn't raise the money to go to Palestine, and then that footage sort of you know, we got busy with other things. And then she passed away in 2018. And I said, Oh, wow, I have, I maybe I have something they can use for her memorial service. And the Dorothy Cotton Institute folks were very excited. And they said they've been wanting to make a film about Dorothy forever and had been looking for somebody to make the movie. And it turns out we were, you know, two blocks apart in downtown Ithaca. And so uh, that got us started uh, collaborating to make this movie. And that also meant we had Dorothy's hard drives, you know, all her speeches and all her stuff that she'd collected and all of it looked fairly crappy because it was VHS, but that's forgivable, I believe, in this situation. So, and once we started working with Dorothy, you know, she inspired us and she still does. We are always thinking, you know, well, what would Dorothy do? <laughs> and, so that really, um, and in fact, I'll mention that we are fundraising, uh, of course, naturally, to have a mural of Dorothy painted on the front of our building on North Tioga Street cool. um, with Ithaca murals. Uh, people were vying for Dorothy. And so I said, well, I, uh, <laughs> I think that would be a great thing on our building. So we're trying to... Um, you know, we picked an expensive artist, so we're working on it. But uh, anyway, that's something we're hoping to do in the future so that Dorothy can be, I mean, ultimately it'd be cool if Dorothy was in the National Women's Hall of Fame. You know, there's a lot of people who had far less of an impact on changing this country than Dorothy that are up there. So that's you know, always a possibility. Other questions? Ingrid? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, Deborah, at the beginning, you made a comment about, um, I think it was maybe animations and sometimes having trouble um, knowing what's real or not. And I was wondering if you could comment more broadly about sort of uh, deep fakes and, and fake video and not knowing what's real and how you think about that as a filmmaker and what's the experience of a viewer of film and not knowing what to trust. Uh, I'm, uh, it's scary, really. Uh, I think um, 
one thing that's important is is educating uh, people, young people in particular, about about media. You know, what's advertising? You know, what's fake? And how do you know? And how to follow up? And of course, that's all nice if somebody has the time and the patience and they really dig deep. Uh, but I worry greatly about. Um, you know, now I, I, I see the ads and some things I there, I can't tell whether it's an ad for a movie or a video game, or I don't even, I don't know. <laughs> of course, you know, I'm old at this point, so I don't get all of that, but um, I'm not sure what there is to do about it. Uh, you know, once again, education has to be key to having, being able to discriminate lies from truth. And I, um, it's something I I do feel good that I feel like I'm trying to work on that <laughs> in our country uh, and just talk about it with with uh, young people too. You know, when you seeing things, talking through anything you see on television or around you. I mean, this is just what I do at least with my grandchildren. I say, "Wow, do you believe that? Or what do you think that looks like? Or why did they do it that way? Or or." you know, where are the people of different races or what do you think, you know, so uh, having good questions um, to raise these topics with, I keep saying young people, but I, I'm sure it can go for it. Right. <laughs> yeah, anyway. um, I, I will note that uh, our friends at Project Look Sharp at Ithaca College yes. do a great, great work in um, helping teach about media literacy and lots and lots of resources for that. Yeah. My daughter went to uh, LACS and took Chris mm -hmm. Ferret's course. Uh, very and good. so uh, about, and they, you know, and it opens their eyes. I mean, I love the way they just went, wow, look at that. Mm -hmm. You know, they would see things that they hadn't noticed before, which is super important in, in all of, you know, all around us. Yeah, yeah. So I'm worried and I don't know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's no help. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe I'll ask Chris to do a, a session for us. You should, you know, yeah. it's good. Yeah, he did actually help. We had, a, um, it wasn't a science in the virtual pub, but one of our online workshops where he, on, on misinformation and dealing with misinformation related to climate change, and he did participate in that one. Um. Yeah, yeah. I didn't realize your kid was old enough, Brandon. To looking at what's in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. uh, um, other questions? If not, I have one or two. I will ask one. So, as a documentary filmmaker, what's your favorite documentary? Two questions. What's your favorite film that you have made thus far? And what's your favorite documentary film that somebody else has made? Well, golly. Well, <laughs> or, I have know, to say does, right does now, it's like Dorothy it. Cotton is right. my right <laughs> now. Uh, but true, I also think, you know, I've made other films. Uh, you know, I made a film um, about Burma that uh, had, you know, showed and th had theatrical showings all over the country. It was fascinating because, um, it was footage that a colleague of, had collected in Burma at, and when it was illegal to videotape. And so it was all stuff that in Burma had been very closed off for 50 years. And it was, it was fascinating and gorgeous. Burma was an amazing place at the time before there were, there were no, there, there were no Kentucky fried chickens. There was no Western influence. It had been really isolated for 50 years. Um, anyway, I can't remember why. I, oh, because that film, uh, Roger Ebert named it one of the top documentaries of 2012. Oh, very cool. You know, and that was that was a big success. That actually really helped put, you know, enable us to make the next movie, which we did. We made a movie about Cambodia. And then I just also, we released a film about um, Mongolia, Genghis Khan. I am. I know a lot about Genghis Khan right now, and it's fascinating. And um, so, I, I, 
my, but right now my favorite is the one I'm working on, which it has to be, because otherwise you would just give up because it's so hard to raise the money and to make these movies, to make them good. Uh, and then you have to, I mean, I enjoy traveling with them. Um, I'm trying to think of, you know, a, few, a couple of films. One film, strangely, that made an impact on me is something called Fog of War by Errol Morris. And uh, it was interviews with um, Rumsfeld. Yeah. And that. what he made, uh, Morris made a, um, a device so that he could talk, that, that the interviewee could see his face right in the camera so it wasn't you were peeking around or finding things and it it created the level of intimacy that i maybe that technicality or something i just thought it was a, it was um an interesting way uh, that he made it oh and i just thought of one of my favorite films by someone else is a film by david gluck called two ball games which he made you know, 40 50 years ago and it without narration it intercuts between a sandlot bas baseball game in front of the Ithaca clock factory down on um, Day Street and an Auburn Little League uniform full game where the coaches um, are tough and the, fa the fans are there and this intercuts these two games in a way that makes a commentary in 20 minutes without um, without anybody, without a narrator, without anybody telling you what to think. And that has had a huge impact on my work. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, anyway, that's that's some stuff. <laughs> and another question from Ingrid. Yeah, um, we often hear it said that people's attention spans have gotten shorter. And I don't know if that's true, if that's based on research or if it's just something that's said, but are there things like that that have, that have changed the way that you make films compared to how you used to? Yes. Um, I would say we get, uh, we do a lot more short, very short format work. Even, you know, a film on the speed of light, how to measure it using a tabletop thing, you know, and that's only five minute movie. You know, so it doesn't dig too deep into, but it's it's an explainer. That's an explainer movie. Um, I hate to think that I I'm going to still make ninety minute feature films, um, and because I it's a it's a very different experience for us and for the audience too. So, but you know that two that trailer was two minutes. You know that's a hook. And that's something that you have to have snazzy to grab people's attention. Um, and uh, we we just I'm I fight it both ways because <laughs> I want it to be I want people to actually probably watch it all the way to the end if it's something that's online, which really means it can't be more than four or five minutes. So, but get somebody in a the theater, dark theater. And they can watch a, a real film. Yeah. Other questions? Rob? <laughs> Is um, you might not like this kind of question to sort of generalize your approach, but I was wondering if, you know, over the decades you have found that there is some particular two or three steps that you find are absolutely essential that run through any film no matter what the subject matter or if you find that it's so varied that you have to think differently for each film that you're making one thing that sounds uh pretty obvious but every everything has to have a beginning and a middle and an end and <laughs> there can be lots of lots of things about that but uh i don't know i always find that helpful and when i'm actually editing or putting something together i start at the beginning <laughs> um and so that's that's one thing that that goes through i'm also always looking for humor 
Um, anytime it can be even something, some uh, you know, it's hard to find in some situations, but even just smiling. And that's one thing I guess I should mention about our our work for science stuff is that it's sort of documentary style. So we get people to talk about something they believe in or they like or that makes them happy. And so they get they get real. They get, you know, they're not, the audience doesn't think they're reading a script or they're, um, they trust them too. I mean, some of the time, although I just, you know, it varies according to the project. Um, did, did I finish answering your question? I guess started talking and. <laughs> Yeah, you did. I think it was probably a oh, different question. beginning in the middle and the end. Yeah, and then the basically what, yeah, is there one method or is it all over the place? It's and and listening to creating when you're listening to material, you're figuring what should be the beginning, you know, and and um and then the middle can have some ups and downs, but that's where the sort of the interest or the emotional art can go in. And so um, I'm, I'm chuckling because I gave a talk on Saturday night at uh, the meeting that we hosted for the uh, Northeastern section of the uh, National Association of Geoscience Teachers. And the question was prefaced by, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt your narrative structure. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, well, right. the narrative, you know, it matters, the storytelling, you know, yeah. so. Um, and we get all hung up in that as filmmakers, you know, so. Great. Great. That's one thing I'll say we've struggled with in a couple of projects where we'll go really down some important animation and all of a sudden the client wants to make everything blue instead of green. And we've done a ton of work or have to be redesigned. And I always say, hey, you know, that's that's where the challenge of being creative and good is, is make it good and blue. You know, we just, that's that's the deal. And so everybody gets pushed, um, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm glad we have clients. You know, I think I, you know, if we never had anybody trying, you know, pushing us, then we, we always just got to do whatever we wanted. It might not be, uh, we wouldn't push ourselves maybe, I don't know. Um, so I've got an, an, another question of um, what advice would you give to somebody starting out in um, in the field, which there are a couple of now on this call? Um, start, you know, make movies with your iPhone and iMovie or get a, you know, that we used to, back in the day, we were shooting with a $100,000 film camera. And editing on a machine that you couldn't, you know, was huge and you couldn't just have. But now, and I think that I do that now too, to push, just try to, you know, do make your own. I make baby movies and things, <laughs> but but do uh, get a camera, the best camera, you know, you can get a, we shot the Burma film with a camera that cost $2,000. And it was one of the top documentaries of the year. You know, you do not need, I um, mean, and so, and the better, the more you practice trying to have a point of view, um, as well as the technical stuff of getting things in focus and hearing audio is huge. People underappreciate audio. It's a terrible problem. Um, it's very important what the sound is. And, um, so I just think it, and then, and then you learn what you kind of like to do. If you start making your own little movies, dabble in editing. Um, I'm always looking for, for pe people who have skills with animation after effects as a program that, um, if you know, there are not enough, <laughs> my Terry. Um, there are not enough After Effects experts around. There's lots of people who can edit. And then I get a lot of people who call me up and say, oh, well, you know, I'm looking for a position. You know, I'm interested in directing. And I'm thinking, well, we don't have any openings in directing. But you got to start 
making your own movies. That's good. Okay. Any other questions? I will also note um, just a, a comment that uh, um, talking about the, the Green Bank radio telescope, my dad um, worked on the uh, Arecibo while it was being built. Oh way back when so yeah yeah and with that gone you know yeah. that that was a huge dish. Well, it was a much bigger dish but it was stuck in the earth so it had it was stuck with whatever the earth was doing whereas a green bank is up and can turn you know so it's a whole thing i could go on and on about it. uh um not not uh not um uh, quite um aaron's arucibo as i recall is a was was a sphere, not not a see, parabola, and they would aim it based on the feed. Yeah, so that they could they could they could see move move um, move uh, the feed around and aim wherever they wanted within, obviously yeah. the mountains. Right. <laughs> yes. Right, yeah. yeah. I just the Green Bank folks always brag about their. Of course. Well, yeah. Well, they get that's that is a nice scope. <laughs> yes. And it's, it's still making it's it's very exciting, um, an interesting place. I recommend going there too, because it's national radio quiet zone, right. where there's no ground based um, cellular service or anything because it disrupts the uh, astronomical observ observations. Yeah. Any other uh, closing questions? I'll put a bunch of links in the chat there for. Um, uh, the upcoming events and uh, uh, oh, and send me the thing about Marianne's. I will. Yes, it's also in the chat, but oh, okay. I will also okay. send it to you. Okay. All right. Well, thanks so much, Deb. It was great. I I learned some stuff. Right. It was it was fun for me to take a trip down memory lane. So. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That was awesome. Oh, good. Thank you. Good. I'm glad you like the video is up already on PRI's yeah. YouTube channel. It's live streaming, but it'll be linked from the Science and the Virtual Pub Events page soonish. I'm I am off tomorrow, but it'll sometime next week I'll get it up. Thanks so much. Take care, everybody. Yes, thanks all. Have a great night. And see you in two weeks. Bye -bye. Thank you.